Welcome to Digital Asset News, the top stories in cryptocurrency and digital assets and break them down to bite-sized pieces. Today, we've got some pretty good stuff, which is amazing on a Sunday. First up, banks must establish infrastructure for digital assets before it's too late. This is a very well-written article, but there's three criteria and why it's all going to lead to banks collapsing. Also, the SEC issues no action letter in response to digital asset securities questions. What this means is it's a hands-off approach to securities. And what is this going to mean for the overall cryptocurrency digital asset market? I think it'll be huge. Also, in one of the most depressing stories of the day, KuCoin's hack drags Ocean Protocol and Uniswap into the mud. So we're going to go over what's happening, happening exactly with Ocean, how it's being dragged down, and how Uniswap could be in the eyes of the regulators starting very soon. We'll go over all of that in Q and C of the day at the very end, but first let's jump into the market. So what is going on? So today, Sunday, September 27th, everything's going good. Not a bad start. What do we got? Bitcoin as at 10.7, down 0.1%, down 3% for the week. But hey, you know what? Uh, I thought I was going to dip below 10. And here we are at 10.7. So I'm pretty happy about that. Ethereum's keeping that line above 350. Fantastic job, Ethereum. Tether's Tether with a market cap of 15 billion. Nobody cares. XRP, also the second stable coin. I'm just kidding. I always call it stable coins. Not, but it's, it's crazy that you'll have good news about ripple you have good news about a partnership you know someone's using xrp and the price just stays the same unbelievable then you have something like uh you know tomato coin somebody picks it up off the ground and says it's really shiny and it goes up 10 percent it's just that's cryptocurrency what can you do bitcoin cash up 2.1 percent and uh again there might be some uh, big news on the uh, hard fork coming up in november um well not really news i think it's i know it's going to happen so maybe there might be more tokens on the on the horizon and, and hey, who knows? Uh, Bitcoin Cash and uh, XRP, only 6 billion separates them. No, nah, I'm just kidding. No, they won't flip. Uh, Chainlink up 4%. Fantastic. 1071. I like to see that. And then what else is big? Cardano up 8%. Uh, Bitcoin SV, I had a Still don't know why it's in the top 10. I have no clue. Somebody please help me out on that one. Monero up 4%. Great. What are uh, some other big losers or gainers? Yearn up 3% at 30,000. Yeah, it was just like 20,000 not too many days ago. Unbelievable. And uh, nothing really too fantastic. Just kind of in between that 1% and 5% area, either up or down. Mostly down. A little bit of a red. But it is Sunday. That's normal. That's par for the course. Uh, interesting stuff. But Let's jump into the real big stories. First up, uh, this was so well written, uh, I have to ask the question, who wrote this? And the title was, Banks Must Establish Infrastructure for Digital Assets Before It's Too Late. And let's just scroll all the way down and find out who the heck this is. So this is uh, actually two people, uh, Gunnar Harv, Jarv, I know I didn't say that right, and Glenn Wu, I think I nailed that one. So Gunnar is a chief operating officer of First Digital Trust, Hong Kong's technology-driven financial institution, uh, blah, blah, blah. Uh, prior to joining First Digital Trust, Gunner founded several tech startups, including Hong Kong-based Peak Digital. And Gunner, managing director of APAC at Ledger, an industry leader in developing security infrastructure solutions for cryptos and blockchain applications. Extensive career in financial services, technology industry, working for S&P Global Market. So uh, these two guys, uh, looks like it was worked together and it's really great. And let's just jump into it. The big stuff is, this is the big takeaway that I, I, I took from the whole thing, which was... Uh, Banks will fail, and uh, the only way that they can bail themselves out is to partner up with the uh, new systems that are coming about, uh, whatever cryptocurrency digital assets they can get their grubby little hands on, because if they do it from scratch, uh, they're going to fail just like Blockbuster. Anyhow, what's going on here? So the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, or OCC, officially announced that all nationally chartered banks in the U.S. can provide custody services for a cryptocurrency. This was like a month or two back, and uh, everybody was like, super excited about that. And, uh, you know, we're like, oh, this is going to be great, and they're going to do it. But uh, there was a great article. This is how I got in touch with Alex Maschioli, and he said, hold your horses. That's not going to happen. Banks aren't known for innovation. And uh, he was totally right. They haven't done anything. And here we are, what, a couple months later. So, hey, what are you going to do? Uh, July 29th? Yeah, about a couple months. So the big question, or one of the big questions that these banks are asking is, hey, where are these newly acquired digital assets going to be stored? How do we do that? Because we can't just put like money in a vault. We can't put gold in the vault. Not that they do that anyhow, I might add, because most of the time it's like they have 1% of their total cash flow in the actual bank. And most of it's just zeros and ones. 
on a uh, digital ledger. They have no money. If you went into the bank right now, or let's just say 5% of people went to their local branch and said, I want all my money back. Uh, they wouldn't be able to do it. They're like, uh, sorry, sir, man, we don't keep money here. We're just a bank. <laughs> <laughs> so anyhow, that's one of their problems. So where are they going to store these digital assets? Because they have no idea. According to Financial Action Task Force's yearly report, the industry, let me move this, the industry's lack of infrastructure is limiting compliance and safe storage of assets. As traditional financial markets begin to embrace the space, they must develop robust, tailored technology solutions with the strength of a legacy system. So let me just back up. What they're saying here is that they have to pretty much go from scratch. They have to build this from the ground floor up, and later they'll talk about partnerships, and they need to do all this and innovate because they're banks. I read this, and I almost snorted because I was laughing. And uh, it's just it just comes down to the fact of they won't, and that's why they're going to be left behind. I don't dislike – I hold on. I'll be honest with you. I do dislike banks. I dislike some banks, especially my banks, because I've always talked about them. My personal bank's awesome, USAA. My business banks suck, and they got a lot of problems, and there's a lot of fees, and I just don't like them. But uh, besides that, I mean, the people that work in banks, I like the people. People are good. Uh, just that the banks themselves, they're just bloated, and they're uh, archaic, and they need to go. And they're going to be left behind. So the thing is that they're not going to innovate, just like Blockbuster. Does anybody remember Blockbuster streaming? Neither do I. But guess what? It did happen. And uh, I had to look it up. And Blockbuster Streaming came about because they were trying to compete with Netflix. And they said, oh, we can do that. We're a huge corporation. And guess what? They failed because Netflix was nimble and they were young and they could make all these different decisions and just move in different directions that the normal Blockbuster corp worldwide corporation could not do because they were just bloated top heavy. And uh, that's exactly what's going on here. That's how I think it's going to happen with all industries. You're going to see a bunch of disruptors come up because they can do all these things, because they don't have upper middle management weighing them down. And that's just unfortunately um, how innovation really takes root. So moving down, um, I'm not going to go over the whole thing. I mean, it was very interesting. I'm going to link it in the, to the uh, description of, uh, of this video, but uh, I'll just give you the highlights. The future of finance is moving fast. And if banks don't incorporate the correct protective and regulative mechanisms, assets are at great risk. So meaning if they don't do this right from the ground up, they're going to lose a lot of money, a lot of your money. And uh, I just said, he, I'm like, they're not going to do that. They're, they're going to fail because they're too big to succeed, just like what I talked about. Blockbuster is an obvious uh, example. But this is another, here's another great example that I found. That I've been used this actually a couple of times. And this is um, it's a great one from Data is Beautiful. And they just talk about how the different browsers that came about. If you notice, uh, Internet Explorer around 2001, remember all the way back then, uh, it had 92% uh, market share or you know 90 percent of people were using internet explorer because it was the go-to and you know who makes internet explorer microsoft and they were huge they were a billion dollar company and all these goofy mosaic opera netscape i mean they tried to compete netscape but actually had uh, the market share at the beginning but uh microsoft said we're gonna crush you and then they're gonna they probably thought to themselves we're gonna stay on top well watch this here's this thing called firefox out of nowhere and just comes up in safari but who uses safari only people with Macs. and uh it just started to gain and gain and gain i'm not gonna bore you to death but uh i'm gonna fast forward to a minute and 15 this is 2005 i might add and watch what happened so Firefox is getting traction. Internet Explorer, why is it? There's a thing called Chrome. What's Chrome? No one knows. Just some goofy Google something or other. And all of a sudden, there's just these guys who work out of a out of their garage. They start crushing everybody. And here they are. And Chrome starts to take over. Google takes over. And Google is what it is right now. Just like banks. Banks are the same type of thing. And they're like, you know what? We're going to crush everybody because we have all the money and all the people and whatever else. But guess what? You can't innovate. You can't move fast enough. You're not nimble. And that's just how it is. All right, I'll step off my soapbox for a second and scroll down. So they state, we foresee a parallel system running which players will use infrastructure that works significantly different from traditional payments, networks, or settlement flows. And it's all going to come down to, can they innovate? Can they catch up? And uh, I don't think so, but I could be wrong. Uh, let me know what you think in the comment section. Let's finish this up. So it states, if banks move too quickly to capitalize in the booming space, and I'm sure it's very tempting because if you're a bank, you're like, wow, this is a, this could be the next trillion dollar industry. We need to get on top of this. Um, should we do it right? Well, we'll try, but who knows where the banks. So like I say here, I mean, they are the ones that created, I mean, pretty much the AML and KYC, uh, know your customer and anti-money laundering. And we just had a story 
last week where uh, there was over $2 trillion uh, money laundered. So they can't even, you know, keep in, keep in line with their own infrastructure that, they're, that they built themselves. They can't even stop money laundering. Um, so I said, what makes you think they'll put the customer first? <laughs> They've got to make profits. I just don't think it's going to work out. So lastly, banks entering crypto custody will need tried and true crypto asset technology developed specifically for the industry and will inevitably face the build versus buy decision. So really, if you're a pretty big company, you're like, we don't have the, the time to do all this stuff. We just want to pay somebody to do it. And that's, I think, their only option. I don't think they're going to build it from the ground up. I know JP Morgan's trying to do that. But again, same type of thing. I don't think they're that nimble. I think they have middle management, top management heavy. And to make all the decisions and move as fast as they need to, they're going to lose out. So they should just buy it from the ground from somebody else. The implementation process is not easy, nor is it cheap. They cannot cut corners. Banks will need to develop a team to research and make recommendations, seek approvals, build a team, test prototype technology, and conduct regular cybersecurity assessments. So why would they do it themselves? Just buy it from somebody else. And I know everybody right now probably has their own idea of what that cryptocurrency could be for the banks. And uh, sure, I mean, it could be a number of them. And I don't care what it is. I just want it to be one of them because I'm the biggest cheerleader for all the cryptocurrency. I mean, for the most part, I make fun of XRP because it's a love-hate relationship I have. I just be, I'll be honest. But uh, look, when the, when the water rushes in, all the ships rise. I think if what's good for one is good for all. And if we can get a couple different cryptocurrencies, the bank's like, this is our whatever. Uh, we want to use this one. Sure. I'm happy. I'm cheerleading. I'm, I'm ecstatic. And then lastly, it states this in itself can take years. And uh, if you've been in the space any, any length of time, if you're talking about years, um, what just happened with DeFi in the last month? So <laughs> good luck catching up. And then I just have a little story about Steve Jobs and Bill Gates developed the computer revolution in their garages. Um, and then, you know, IBM they they could have crushed everybody. They had so much money back in the 80s. But Bill Gates said, hey, uh, I, I wrote the OS and I'm going to license it to you. So you want to pay me or you want to build your own team to do it? Because I got it right here. And like, sure. And <laughs> look how that worked out for Gates. So my final thoughts are this. Kraken Financial Services. Uh, they just got a banking license in Wyoming. Uh, they are an exchange. I use them. I recommend them. Uh, they will be the new beacon of light example for what I believe banks to emulate. And I think they're going to go to them like, how do we do this? What's going on? I think that banking license for Kraken is going to push them above all the other exchanges. Just my thoughts. Uh, let me know what you think in the comment section. Let's move on. This one I'm going to go over pretty quickly. Um, it looks like a big thing and it could be, but uh, we'll see. So SEC issues no action letter in response to digital asset securities question. Uh, this no action letter was by the SEC. It focuses on a specific approach to handle trades on an ATS. ATS is an alternative transaction system, namely a so-called three-step approach. And we'll go over that a bit. Digital securities in this context, in this context refer to securities that are held and exchanged via a distributed ledger system, distributed ledger technology, DLT, and all that good stuff. So um, the letter itself looks like this. This was uh, drafted on September 25th, and here's the letter itself. So they were talking about a four-step approach where they would, you know, the archaic one, like, okay, you're going to use this term trading system. Uh, ATS will match the order. ATS notifies the buyer and seller. Then the buyer and seller sells the transaction bilaterally, either directly with each other, or by instructing their respective custodians to settle. And this one is just a three-step approach, kind of the same thing, but they're not going to do it between themselves, just their, their custodians. And the SEC said, hey, we're going to do hands-off as far as securities go, which is great. I mean, there was a big issue with, uh, you know, the SEC going, hey, we're going to cr clamp down on these securities and, and whatnot. But uh, here we are. So this just frees up regulation, which is pretty amazing. And even Brian Brooks from OCC says, hats off. Today, the Securities and Exchange Commission's issued a no-action letter Authorizing, authorizing crypto security tokens to trade on registered exchanges. Good day for investor protection and an emerging asset class. So the thing that comes to my mind, first of all, is that is the uh, Ripple lawsuit uh, that's going on right now. Is XRP an actual security? My question is then is, will this play a big role into that? Will it even make a difference? I don't think XRP wants to be a security, but if it is, I mean, here we are with uh, what just happened right now. Anyhow, let me know what your thoughts are. Um, it's a wide open discussion and uh, let's move on to our last story. This one, I'm just gonna tell you right now, 
a little depressing. So KuCoin got hacked. Uh, I think we've been reporting on that, uh, you know, a couple of days ago, but it goes deeper and it's it's going to be, I think it's going to be far reaching. So Singapore based crypto exchange KuCoin suffered massive attack on 25th of September. That was two days ago, right? It's 27th today. Yes. In which the hackers, they took 150 million worth of digital assets, such as Bitcoin, Ethereum, and others. And these days, I think we're getting so jaded. We're like, ugh, another hack, no big deal. But it is a big deal. I mean, these exchanges, that's the whole reason for an exchange to actually exist, is to make sure that your funds are protected. And even if they have insurance to cover all these things, it still can tank the market, and then you lose money indirectly. So they need to be a little bit more careful with what they're doing. And uh, this is why you know decentralized exchanges are good. Or are they? And I'm going to get to that in a second. So, but it wasn't until the early hours of Sunday that the hackers started to move a large amount of ETH as well as ERC20 tokens. Shortly thereafter, Ocean Protocol notified the community members that around, Jesus, 21 million Ocean, which is worth 8.6 million, was among the stolen funds. This was followed by the platform, the AMM platform, pausing Ocean contracts. So they were able to, this decentralized organization was able to pause the ocean contracts. Interesting. I don't know if you can do that, but uh, <laughs> is it really decentralized? We'll see. This incident caused a decline of 5% over the last 24 hours and dragged the token's price to 36 cents. That's what I'm talking about. They keep going down because of all these different hacks. This should not happen. You shouldn't have to lose money because of an exchange that you trust or, P or an exchange that you don't even trust. That's their whole job is to make sure that it's actually safe. Finishing up, Suzu. I hope I said that right. The CEO of 3R Capital questioned how freely these decentralized platforms were able to pause contracts, what we just talked about. His tweet read, so it seems the time to talk about decentralizing all the things and another time to pause contracts because of a small amount of supply getting hacked. If central actors can freely pause contracts, they also could be forced to do so by regulators in their jurisdictions. That's very true. They could just come down, sure as it, you know, regulators come down and go shut it all down. Ah, well, we've only got 96% uh, power. Fine, shut that part down. And off you go. And then here's the bad news. So on top of all the other bad news, KuCoin hacker, hacker started leveraging the DEX platform, Uniswap, to swap from altcoins to ETH. This was revealed by Alone Gal, the chief technology officer of cybercrime firm Hudson Rock, who tweeted, KuCoin's hacker begins laundering 150 million. Wow. He started swapping his ocean for ETH via Uniswap. Pretty easy place to do that because you go to the other exchanges. They're like, just like how Binance did it. They shut down a hacker who was uh, transferring all the funds because they are a centralized exchange. With Uniswap, you don't have that issue. He already dragged the price down by 4% in less than an hour. It doesn't seem to be slowing down. Due to low liquidity for this token, he's going to crash it hard. Let's find out. Let's see what it is. I don't even know. Well, still at 37 cents, so not too bad, but uh, we'll see exactly how far down it goes. But um, that's awful. Finishing up, while the latest incident did not have much impact on the crypto market in general, but if the swapping continues, DEX giant Uniswap could likely come under the scanner of the regulators because essentially what's going on is they're stealing money and they're using that to essentially launder out money and get, you know, uh, cryptocurrencies. Last. I know it's a loose association. I shouldn't say launder, but let's call a spade a spade. Uh, people steal your money. They go someplace else. They exchange it for something else launder so uh let me know what your thoughts are on that i see some problems on the horizon i see some problems on the horizon but there is a lot of different resolutions and some people will actually say this is a good thing and it's it's a mentality i had done a post on another another hack and somebody had said hackers are good hackers are good for this entire industry and i was like how the heck is that even possible and they said Something along the lines like, well, if there's no hackers, we'll never uncover all the different uh, holes in the protocol, different things that need to be shored up. So yes, you're going to lose some money now, but in the long run, it's better because you're going to be able to fix it. I see the the reasoning behind it, but that try telling that to all the people who lost the money in like the Mount Gox. You know, these days these exchanges have uh, insurance; they can they can cover it, uh, and they take the hit. But uh, I don't know; it just seems like a very odd thing. And then if you if you take that same type of mentality, same thing happens here. Well, hey, it's a bad thing, but it's going to improve the uh, exchanges for security. I got to tell you, I got to tell you uh, that it seems like there's a bunch of hacks. And it still keeps happening. So I don't know if they're going to get any better or not. I don't know what the resolution is. That's for somebody smarter than me. I'll just say that. Anyhow, 
Let's leave that and go into Q of the day. So let's jump in the office. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Q of the day. Uh, it is Sunday. It is 11 o'clock a.m. Texas time. Everything's right in the world. So uh, we've got uh, a Q of the day, which is a pretty good question about dollar inflation. And uh, the C of the day, which is correction of the day, which I have to go over uh, just one thing. So I've been doing pretty good as far as not making uh, too many colossal errors. Uh, but every so often, I do a stumble. So I just make, need to correct myself and just say, uh, hey, made a mistake, and I'll correct that. So uh, for Q of the day, uh, this comes to us from John. And John says, hello, Dan. I enjoy the podcast. Thanks, John. I appreciate it. Help me wrap my brain around something, if I have this wrong. By pegging stable coins to any fiat or dollar or whatever, fiat, cash, won't we still suffer from inflation, deflation, hyperinflation? By pegging any coin to the dollar as it inflates, doesn't that have an impact on the coin tied to it? And uh, it's a good question. And so it's one of those things that people say like, you know, because we're always looking at the actual market and saying, oh, well, you know, Bitcoin's going up and down and the, and the value of it is, you know, going from 10,700 to 10,900 and, and then, then it goes on 10,000. So we're always thinking about it. It actually fluctuates. So with uh, stable coins, it's not like that because it is pegged to the dollar. It's always going to be around a dollar. Like, you know, sometimes Tether is like 99 cents. Sometimes it's a, it's a dollar or one. So maybe that, that is the confusion. But it really goes down to the actual strength of, of the dollar. So if you have uh, Tether or um, USDC or whatever else, uh, any kind of stable coin else that you have, uh, it is pegged to that dollar. So uh, the dollar strength goes up, it goes up. The dollar strength goes down, it goes down. And this is one of those things where people, they get confused about the actual dollar. So like, oh, well, you know, the dollar isn't, isn't worth as much. So instead of a dollar being a dollar, now it's 90 cents. That's uh, not really how it works. Actually, um, there is this, this, this great image that I've used a couple of times. I'm going to use it again because uh, I like to reuse stuff. I throw things away when it's good, good info. And it talks about the purchasing power of the U.S. dollar from 1913 to 2013. And uh, uh, I... I uh, would hate to see what the purchasing power is in 2020. Jeez, that would be an awful one. So as we can see right here, 1913, uh, the Federal Reserve was created and a dollar was worth a dollar. Everything was good and right in the world. Everybody was happy. And uh, this is when you get your grandparents going, you know, I could have bought a car for a nickel or whatever else. And, you know, maybe they could have because, you know, the dollar was worth so much uh, back then. I mean, I'm just kidding. It wasn't worth a dollar. But, uh, but you can see as uh, uh, time went on, it just kind of collapsed. And that's around 1920, 1918. And then, of course, in 1933, FDR's executive order makes it illegal to hold coins, bullions, or certificates. So it went a little up, up a little bit. And then, of course, then it started to go down. 1944, Bretton Woods established the USD as the world's reserve currency. And you would think, okay, well, you know, it's the world's reserve currency, so the purchasing power should go up. Ah, no, not at all, because Federal Reserve is there to uh, bombard the day and just start printing uh, cash all over the place. And, of course, 1971, Nixon closes the gold window. Uh, modern day fiat currency system only. So the dollar, of course, is not backed by anything. It's just the uh, uh, faith and uh, trust of the U.S. government, which, you know, who doesn't want to trust the U.S. government? So uh, we have that, and if it's not backed to the gold, and that's a big thing. And now in 2013, uh, a dollar that you could have had in 1913 in 100 years was now, it's now worth a nickel. So here is the problem um, with the dollar losing its purchasing power and all the uh, the Federal Reserve actually printing money because when the Federal Reserve prints money, which they did, you know, I think uh, what, two, three trillion, something like that, you know, just a little bit. Um, it doesn't go to me and you first, right? It doesn't like it, it starts getting printed off of them. Here you go. Uh, usually it goes to these big players, these big institutions, the big banks. And then usually a, a large chunk of that money uh, goes to large corporations, conglomerates and whatever else. So uh, they have all this money and it hasn't really disseminated throughout uh, the whole economy. So hey, they haven't flooded the actual market or you know, uh, the, the economy itself with just dollar bills. So their purchasing power is pretty much on point until they start to inject that uh, into the market by buying whatever they buy. You know, they buy back their stocks, they buy back more assets, or they buy assets, or they buy you know, uh, whatever they buy. And uh, then it goes down to like people you know, like you and me who just get the scraps and we're like, hey, thanks. And of course, the dollar comes to us and we're like, hey, this is now worth three cents. What the heck happened? So as you print more money, this is the problem. So the original question is, uh, it's pegged to uh, these stable coins, so one to one. So it's not gonna be like you're gonna see like 90 cents, 80 cents, 70 cents. What it's just gonna be is that your stable coin, it's stable, 
just the purchasing power sucks. And that's really what happens. So uh, that's all. That's all for that one. So hopefully, uh, uh, John, thanks for that good question. I really appreciate it. And then let's go on to the C of the day. Now what you think. So correction of the day. Uh, there was a post that I put out. Uh, it was about Alex Maschioli. Uh, I'm always talking about on, on, on the show because he is, you know, traditional finance. And now he's got into uh, cryptocurrency digital assets. And he's got his pulse on like pretty much what you would call whales and big players in the institution on top of all the big names in cryptocurrency uh, that he gets on his show. And um, he had a segment where it was, it was talking about is Cardano, Chainlink, uh, Theta, uh, is about to explode and then here's some you know they do a bunch of technical analysis which i must tell you uh puts me to sleep but uh i mean for, for some of you ta people i know you guys love it and gals which are there's not that many many uh gals on my show i will i'll just say that because that's just the, the demographics but uh when, when he's doing ta uh it was a lot of good information and uh, monty uh, one of the guys from market rebellion he had called chain link at uh this is when it was like 17, 16, 17, 18 dollars, somewhere around there. And he's like, it's going to 1050. And I was like, this kid doesn't know what he's talking about. And then of course it went to 1050. And now he's calling for it to actually, you know, run up, uh, up to a margin of 25%. And it looks pretty good. They also talk about, like I said, uh, Cardano and Chainlink, and everything else, and uh, the different, um, uh, what are they talking about as far as uh, banks and stable coins. So it was actually all good news. And what I wrote was uh, bad news if you're a holder, check the data. And I put that out on Friday. And while I was trying to rush and get things done, so I was trying to put out, I was trying to put out the video. Uh, I was trying to, you know, push th this information out. I was trying to line up my my show next week. And I'm home. I'm helping homeschool my grandson. So <laughs> it's like everything's everything's all on, on at once. Oh, on top of the other businesses, uh, you know, for like my Amazon, the sports facility, and stuff like that. I'm like, okay, let's get this done. And I just got discombobulated and I put in uh, bad news if you're a holder. So it uh, should be good news. So I corrected that and then I, and everybody who, and I will tell you this, thanks so much for letting me know that I screwed up because uh, without you, I wouldn't have known I screwed up. So thanks. Uh, and so what I did was I just wrote it back to everybody said, Hey, that's my fault. And I changed the title. So uh, that was the C of the day. Sorry about that. And um, I mean, regardless though, I mean, it was still it's still good information. Like if it's bad news and, and they talk about the market's gonna crash, then maybe you wanna start to, you know, take some of your funds out. I'm not that way, I just invest, I, just, I don't really even care. But, uh, you know, if that was the case, sure. That, now that it's good news, you know, maybe you look at that and go, ah, well, you know, maybe I can plan for it to take profits or uh, maybe I wanna uh, increase my position another five or 10% because it looks like things might go up. That's all up to you, but uh, yeah. Sorry about that one, a little, little see of the day. A little error, but uh, hey, no one's perfect. All right, so that's it for, for that segment. Let's jump back. All right, hope that answered everybody's question on that one. It was a pretty good question. I like that one. Uh, a lot of a lot of history behind that as well. So uh, that's it for today's video. If you need an alternative to Coinbase or KuCoin, <laughs> then definitely take a look at the uh, exchange and um, wallet fees uh, spreadsheet. There is a link in every one of my videos in the description. It's gonna look something like this. And what it does is it breaks down all the different exchanges and wallets and decentralized exchanges that I've ever used or am currently using. And if I recommend them or not based on different criteria. And I talk about all the different fee charts and if you're going to uh, get any kind of interest rate just for just for sticking them around or any or any kind of fee for taking them off and swapping there, all that stuff. And uh, I just give you like, you know, just a breakdown of what I've what I've got and what I don't recommend. eToro, don't recommend them. And, uh, Lastly, I have a one, two, I guess one, two, three punch, as I call it now, uh, Celsius, Voyager, and Kraken. There is no perfect exchange. Let me just say that. Voyager's got its issues. Celsius has a little bit of issue. Kraken has a little issue. But uh, it's the ones that I use the most and the one I recommend. You can you can go right to Kraken, right to Celsius, right to Gemini. What well, doesn't matter. You can go right there. But if you use my affiliate links, you can get between 10 and 25 bucks if you sign up. And uh, that's the big thing. So thanks uh, for sticking around. I really appreciate it. And uh, I'll see you on the next one.